Good evening. On the calendar, Labor Day, the traditional opening of the American presidential campaigns. And today, the major candidates opened in areas they'll need to win in November. Jimmy Carter went to his base, the South, and at a Labor Day picnic, he had high praise for the striking Polish workers. Judy Woodruff, reporting from Tuscumbia, Alabama. It was at a huge Labor Day picnic in near 100 degree Alabama heat that the president kicked off his fall campaign. Mr. Carter used the occasion to give the first official U.S. response to the labor settlement in Poland. The working men and women of Poland have set an example for all those who cherish freedom and human dignity. They have shown the world not just how to win a victory for labor, but that the hunger for human rights is everywhere. The South is the president's home base. Aides are confident he'll win most of it. But with Reagan, a popular figure here, it'll be tougher than it was four years ago. And today, Mr. Carter openly asked for support. This will be a campaign for a secure peace. This will be a campaign for jobs. This will be a campaign for stable prices, a campaign of confidence and unity. Members of the Ku Klux Klan, with headquarters in this area, marched before the rally through the town of Tuscumbia to protest the president's visit. In his speech, Mr. Carter accused them of living in the past and said the South must go forward. I say that these people in white sheets do not understand our region and what it's been through. They do not understand what our country stands for. They do not understand that the South and all of America must move forward. A member of the Carter cabinet also referred to the Ku Klux Klan recently. Health and Human Services Secretary Patricia Harris suggested in a speech that white sheets remind her of Ronald Reagan. It was that reference that prompted a Reagan advisor to accuse the Carter campaign of mudslinging. But neither in Alabama nor back at the White House tonight, where the president was host at a picnic for labor leaders, were there further harsh attacks on Reagan. Mr. Carter's aides say they've got the material, but as long as Reagan draws attention to himself with controversial statements, they don't need to use it. Judy Woodruff, NBC News. Ronald Reagan was after the blue-collar vote of the Northeast today, and as Chris Wallace reports, Reagan was also working the Polish connection. Reagan went to a Labor Day picnic that was a candidate's delight, complete with singing and dancing. And the Statue of Liberty is a backdrop. And Reagan aides pointed out that while the president was in the Deep South protecting his base, Reagan was in a heavily Democratic part of New Jersey, reaching out for new support. Reagan aimed his speech at ethnic voters, charging that Mr. Carter's economic policies have broken this country's historic promise. Jimmy Carter's administration tells us that the descendants of those who sacrificed to start again in this land of freedom may have to abandon the dream that drew their ancestors to a new life in a new land. You're right. The Carter record is a litany of despair, of broken promises, of sacred trusts abandoned and forgotten. Quoting labor leader George Meany and paraphrasing John Kennedy, Reagan said when he's president, the American worker will once again be heard in Washington. He warned voters not to be fooled by election year promises, like Mr. Carter's new economic program. American workers have now been discovered by the administration. Well, it won't work. It's cynical, it's political, and it's too late. Reagan even had a surprise ending, introducing the father of Polish Union leader Lesz Walesa and leading the crowd in a chorus of God Bless America. Reagan aides were delighted with today's events, saying that after two rocky weeks, they'll be more careful to make Jimmy Carter the issue. Labor Day is traditionally the start of the fall campaign, and the Reagan camp hopes that voters will regard any recent mistakes as a kind of exhibition season. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Detroit. The independent presidential candidate John Anderson made a series of Labor Day appearances in his home state of Illinois, concentrating on Chicago suburbs. Here's Bob Jamison with Anderson. John Anderson began Labor Day working one side of the street in Calumet City, Illinois, a white ethnic blue-collar suburb of Chicago, while his running mate, Patrick Lucy, was working the other side. So few people recognized Lucy that the campaign sent a runner ahead in the Kiwanis Club Parade to announce who the man in the neat blue suit was. Here he 
The start of Anderson's national unity campaign was on a scale much smaller than the president's or Ronald Reagan's. With no federal money and with fundraising sagging badly, there is no cash for the splashy television campaign Anderson wanted or for some big event like the Whistle Stop tour that was canceled last week. But Anderson did have some large-scale rhetoric today, first calling Ronald Reagan irrelevant. Mr. Reagan isn't even a man for the 1950s, although he professes... <laughs> He's really a man of the 1920s. And calling the president ineffective. One thing he has done, he planned a recession and by golly it worked. It worked. It arrived. Anderson also criticized the president for saying that a nuclear war is winnable. But later when pressed, he admitted the president hadn't said that. But Anderson maintained Mr. Carter believes it. Bob Jamison, NBC News with the Anderson campaign in Park Forest, Illinois. The number two men on the Democratic and Republican tickets, Walter Mondale and George Bush, were at work today as well. Mondale, who has strong ties to organized labor, campaigned at a United Labor picnic in Pennsylvania before going on to another Labor Day picnic in Cleveland. That's an important industrial area. Republican George Bush was where he'd like to be all during the campaign, out front, in this case, riding in the pace car at the Darlington 500 stock car race near Florence, South Carolina. For all the candidates, the engines are now started, the race is on. This is NBC Nightly News, with Tom Brokaw substituting for John Chancellor. Good evening. The 1980 presidential campaign is off to a stormy start involving President Carter, Ronald Reagan, and the Ku Klux Klan. It began with a Reagan statement in Detroit last night. The Republican candidate referred to the president's Labor Day appearance in Tuscumbia, Alabama, a city where the Klan is active. Here's what Reagan said in Detroit. I'm happy to be here where you're dealing at first hand with the economic problems that have been committed, and he's opening his campaign down in the city that gave birth to and is the parent body of the Ku Klux Klan. President Carter, who condemned the Klan during his Alabama appearance, today moved his campaign to Missouri for a visit with Harry Truman's widow, Bess. And the president had a Truman-like reaction to Reagan's remark. Judy Woodruff with the Carter campaign. At the airport in Kansas City, Missouri, the president was quick to criticize Reagan's remarks. Anybody who results, resorts to uh, slurs and to innuendo against the whole region of the country based on a false statement and a false premise is not doing the South or our nation a good service. I think it was uncalled for, I think it was inaccurate, and I think it was uh, something that all Southerners will resent. As an American and a Southern, I resent it. The criticism grew stronger at a town meeting in Independence. Ignoring John Anderson, the president said between him and Reagan, voters faced the sharpest difference in choice this fall they faced in more than half a century. I believe in peace. I believe in arms control. I believe in controlling nuclear weapons. I believe in the rights of working people of this country. I believe in looking forward and not backward. I don't believe the nation ought to be divided one region from another. In all these respects, Governor Reagan is different from me. Mr. Carter didn't argue with one questioner's assertion that both he and Reagan want to increase defense spending, but he said they differ sharply on the control of nuclear weapons. He zeroed in on Reagan's plan to initiate what he called a massive nuclear arms race. I consider this one of the most serious threats to the safety and the security and the peace of our nation and the world that is being dramatized in this 1980 election. Even as he tries to paint Reagan as an extremist in defense policy, the president doesn't want to sound soft himself. He pointed out today that he never wants to see the United States second to the Soviet Union and said he favors delaying ratification of the SALT II Treaty until after the Russians have moved to get their troops out of Afghanistan. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, Independence, Missouri. Politics aside, Reagan was factually wrong when he called Tuscumbia, Alabama, the birthplace of the Klan. Actually, it was born in Pulaski, Tennessee, which is about 70 miles north of Tuscumbia. And in Alabama today, there was a lot of unhappiness about Reagan's statement. Here's Phil Bremen. 
The Knights of the Ku Klux Klan moved from Louisiana to Tuscumbia, Alabama just five weeks ago. Their national headquarters is this two-room building. Many people here are embarrassed by the Klan's presence and enraged that Ronald Reagan should call this the Klan's birthplace. In Montgomery, Governor Bob James sent Reagan a telegram and read it to reporters. If this report is true, you owe us an immediate apology. I demand it. Congressman Ronnie Flippo represents the district Reagan was talking about. The congressman called Reagan's remark an insult and a slur, as well as a misstatement of fact. As many voters in today's non-presidential primary know, the Klan was born in Pulaski, Tennessee, not where Reagan said. Well, he was about 70 miles off. <laughs> but that doesn't change your opinion of no, Reagan? No, not at all, not at all. Does that change your opinion of Reagan at all? Well, yeah, but still, we know what Carter done. But other voters here reacted differently. They're furious, just like I was. I was a Reagan person, really, because I felt that he was the lesser of the two evils. But now, I'm jumping back across the fence. If you want the honest truth, I consider Governor Reagan uh, sort of a bozo. Well, if I was Reagan, I would go somewhere and fall in a hole, just pull a hole in after me so no one would ever see me again. Campaign leaders were giving Reagan a good chance for a Republican to do well in Alabama. But now he and they have an unexpected problem to contend with. Phil Bremen, NBC News in Northern Alabama. Independent presidential candidate John Anderson also was critical of Reagan's reference to President Carter and the Klan. Anderson said, Carter disapproves of the Klan, so I don't think it's a fair comment to make. Anderson also said Reagan seems to have had more than his quotient of, quote, flip offhand remarks that are not very well thought through. As for Reagan, this afternoon he did telephone Alabama Governor Bob Jones to apologize for the remarks. Reagan also said that his Klan comments were not planned. More from Chris Wallace. Reagan met with top aides in his hotel suite most of the afternoon, discussing how to handle his latest controversy. Finally, a junior staffer handed out a written statement for stalling any questions. Reagan said, I intended no inference that Mr. Carter was in any way sympathetic to the Klan, and in no way did I intend to disparage the town of Tuscumbia or the state of Alabama. But Reagan charged, Mr. Carter and members of his campaign staff have tried to exploit this situation for political purposes, accusing the president of a desperate attempt to divert attention from his own record. Earlier in the day, Reagan continued his attack on the administration's economic problems meeting with leaders of the troubled auto industry, and touring the assembly line for Chrysler's new compact K-Car. Reagan told auto workers, whose union has endorsed Mr. Carter, that the president has been too slow in getting Washington out of their business. If I am elected and have an administration, I'd like to go a lot farther than a little tinkering with regulations. I'd like to get rid of several thousand of what I think are unnecessary regulations that have caused your problems. An aide said later, Reagan wanted to cut environmental and mileage regulations, not those affecting worker safety. The auto workers gave Reagan a mixed reception, including some loud boos. But for all Reagan's efforts to keep attacking on the economy, yesterday's Klan remark has once again put him on the defensive. Reagan aides say that the bloopers, as one called them, are now beginning to add up. And they're also worried about how much damage has been done in the South, a region they're counting on. Reagan heads for the Deep South later this week and what is turning into yet another salvage mission. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Detroit. Those wondering whether this would be a... Here's the latest line on the presidential debates. Anderson says he'll take on Reagan alone if the president won't debate Anderson. Reagan raised the possibility that he wouldn't debate at all if Anderson isn't included. The president's spokesman said he wanted a clarification of Reagan's statement. As Bob Jamison reports, Anderson is especially determined to get in on some kind of debate. Anderson indicated in Detroit that he would be willing to debate Ronald Reagan alone if President Carter refuses the League of Women Voters invitation. But there was no way, he told reporters, that he would step aside to let Mr. Carter and Governor Reagan debate without him. And if there are no debates, Anderson said, President Carter should be blamed. It will not be upon my head. By what right, by what objective standard does he seek to tell the American people? to whom they shall listen in campaign 80. 
Anderson's passion over the debate stems not just from a sense of fair play. He is counting on that national exposure to lift his sagging campaign, which didn't draw enough people to fill Kennedy Square at noontime. His immediate problem is money. Anderson is denied access to federal funds because he is an independent, not a third-party candidate. His fundraising trailed off in the last month. He has collected less than half of the $12 million he says he needs to run a serious campaign. But Anderson was cheered today when the Federal Election Commission's lawyers said he should be treated like a third-party candidate and given funds retroactively. He could then borrow millions against that guarantee. We are on our way. This campaign is off and running. But four years ago, the Election Commission got similar advice to give independent Eugene McCarthy access to federal money retroactively. Democrats on the commission, however, fearing McCarthy would hurt Jimmy Carter, blocked his access to the funds and are expected to try to do the same later this week. That would leave Anderson only one more chance to get the quick infusion of cash he needs badly for a federal court in Washington to order the commission to help him, as the independent candidate has asked it to do. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Detroit. From Georgia, Jimmy Carter's home state, a piece of bad news for John Anderson tonight. The Georgia Secretary of State said Anderson can't get on the ballot there, that too many of his signatures on petitions were invalid. As they have in the past in other states, the Anderson people said they would take Georgia to court. Ronald Reagan spent the day with advisors preparing a speech for tonight and trying to repair a part of a speech that he gave on Monday night. The Monday speech included the suggestion that President Carter was campaigning for the Ku Klux Klan vote. More from Chris Wallace. Reagan was trying hard today to bury the Klan controversy. He met this morning at his Virginia estate with top economic advisors, as Press Secretary Lynn Nofziger proclaimed the Klan remark a dead story. But in Washington, the story was very much alive. Top campaign aides appeared almost shell-shocked by what one of them called another rocky day. It's early in a campaign. Uh, they always, ha always have some... Uh, I remember Jimmy Carter and, and uh, with lust in his heart. I, I can't say that it doesn't detract. Of course it does, Lou. I just hope it doesn't happen in the future. In the field operations section at Reagan headquarters, staffers were trying to assess the damage. The campaign is counting on a strong showing in southern and border states, hoping to cut into Jimmy Carter's base. Organizers were especially optimistic about their chances in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, and Virginia. In fact, they felt the president had gone to Alabama Monday because of Reagan's southern strength. Since the Klan remark, staffers say calls have poured in from the south, with volunteers and Democrats for Reagan the most upset. They do not yet view the damage as beyond repair. All the same, there has been some serious fallout. The Reagan camp had been talking to Alabama's Democratic Governor Bob James about endorsing Reagan. Aides now call those talks frozen, despite Reagan's apology to the governor yesterday. And staffers are so concerned about offending Southern pride that they are openly admitting Reagan made a foolish mistake and had not planned any regional insult. The only member of the Reagan camp who managed to sound upbeat today was vice presidential running mate George Bush campaigning in Mississippi. Years. People are fair. Uh, he made a mistake. He said he made a mistake. He apologized. Uh, it takes a big person to do that sometimes. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign. President Carter today was endorsed by Jerry Wirf, president of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. That's a union representing about a million government workers. Wirf told the president, however, that he couldn't guarantee that his union members would follow his recommendation. President Carter then took his campaign to Philadelphia, a city that he failed to carry during the primaries. Touring an Italian neighborhood, the president said Ronald Reagan once suggested that Social Security be voluntary, and he reminded Philadelphians of a big Navy contract coming up for their shipyards. At an all-black Baptist church, the president recalled the election of Richard Nixon when the Democrats were badly divided in 1968. He said that set back civil rights, warning it could happen again. President Carter also invoked Senator Kennedy's name at that church, saying Kennedy had called to wish him well and to urge a united Democratic Party. Kennedy was in Cincinnati today, appearing before the International Association of Machinists. The machinists who supported Kennedy during the primaries today voted not to endorse a candidate for the November election. 
Good evening. The slam-bang pace of the presidential campaign continued today as Ronald Reagan accused President Carter of playing a dangerous political game with national security. Reagan charged the President and Defense Secretary Harold Brown deliberately leaked news of a new airplane called Stealth, which can't be spotted by radar. The Pentagon was identified as the source of the leak in earlier congressional testimony. Chris Wallace with more on the Reagan charges. Reagan told a meeting of Florida businessmen the Carter administration had deliberately jeopardized national security. Charging the Pentagon leaked the stealth aircraft story to help Mr. Carter win re-election. The administration's decision to disclose and then exploit for political purposes this super secret technology in an effort to blur its dismal defense record is a cynical misuse of power and a clear abuse of the public trust. It is the story of the Carter administration's willingness to actually compromise our long-term national security for a two-day headline. Reagan charged Mr. Carter has politicized defense and foreign policy more than any other president. He said the stealth leak will give the Soviet Union a 10-year head start in developing ways to counter the aircraft. And he noted there are severe penalties for violating weapons case, secrets. Because the breach of secrecy was blessed and sanctioned by the Carter administration itself, there will be no such penalty. But the fact remains, it has dealt the nation a grievous blow. As Reagan struggled to regain the offensive, a new advisor joined his plane. Stu Spencer, who helped run Gerald Ford's 1976 campaign. Spencer said one of his jobs will be to prevent incidents like Reagan's Ku Klux Klan remark. Today, Reagan turned aside a question on the Klan, saying the real issue is Jimmy Carter's record. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Jacksonville, Florida. In Washington, Defense Secretary Harold Brown told a congressional subcommittee that leaks about that secret airplane didn't come from the Pentagon. Brown said that after the initial leaks, the Pentagon discussed the airplane publicly in an effort to limit the damage. Here is some of what Brown told the House Armed Services Subcommittee. My instructions were to keep the existence and even more the details of the program secret as long as I could. I did. I'm still keeping this detail secret. My concern was and remains that following the leaks about the existence of the program, which were deplorable, that a failure by us to say anything would have led to a cascade of other information, including the technical and operational details that are indeed the heart of the program. And we have, so far, stopped that. President Carter's Day. As Judy Woodruff reports, he was picking up some important political support, the endorsement of the AFL-CIO. It's my great pleasure, Mr. President, to advise you that this general board of the AFL-CIO has just adopted a motion of endorsement of uh, your presidency. The president himself president led the applause. The labor organization had just okayed a strong statement saying Ronald Reagan's election would halt the nation's efforts to achieve equality and social and economic justice. In his remarks, Mr. Carter also criticized Reagan, but not by name, in commenting on the recent trade union agreement in Poland. In our country, some people who've raised the Polish workers' strike and praised it seem to be a lot more supportive of strong trade unions overseas than they are here at home. Although several of its member unions were active, the AFL-CIO sat out the primary season. But this fall, the AFL plans to go all out. Its organizational efforts could make the difference for Mr. Carter in several key states, including New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and California. The AFL-CIO expects to spend more than $10 million encouraging its members to register and vote and providing member unions with materials like this, which it has already sent out, attacking Reagan's record as strongly anti-labor. There will be more material mailed out in the next few weeks that is pro-Carter. But a Carter campaign aide says much of the focus will be anti-Reagan. In his words, there are a lot of people in organized labor who wonder whether the president has really delivered. To overcome that, we've got to get them to take a closer look at the other guy. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, the White House. President Carter's efforts to arrange a Middle East summit sometime after the election came under fire today. John Anderson was the critic. He spoke before B'nai B'rith, a leading Jewish organization. Here's Bob Jamison. 
furs. Anderson accused President Carter of trying to turn the Middle East negotiations to his own political advantage. Anderson said the way Mr. Carter trumpeted the resumption of the autonomy talks left the false impression there had been some breakthrough. Surely, this is a subject and an occasion calling for understatement and not for the kind of commentary that simply smacks of campaign rhetoric. And no candidate should seek to blur the distinction between our national dedication to the cause of peace and an individual's eagerness to be elected. Anderson said the president's handling of the announcement was insensitive and inflated expectations at a delicate time. It was just like the morning of the Wisconsin primary, he said, when Mr. Carter went on television to say there seemed to be movement in the Iran hostage situation. While Anderson was speaking, the Federal Election Commission gave his campaign a big boost by voting that he was eligible for federal funds after the election. Two of the three Democrats on the commission joined the three Republicans in deciding Anderson would be eligible if he gets at least 5% of the vote in November. The decision helps Anderson because he can now borrow millions for his cash-starved campaign using the prospect of federal funds as collateral. Aides plan to step up his private fundraising, though, worried that when news of the election commission's action spreads, contributions will be more difficult to get. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Washington. The Stealth, a secret American airplane that can't be spotted by radar, is in the middle of a nasty fight between the Reagan and Carter campaigns. Reagan accused President Carter and Defense Secretary Brown of jeopardizing national security by leaking news of the secret plane. Today, the Republicans stepped up their attacks, while the Democrats heated up their denials. Here are two reports. If Ronald Reagan wanted to provoke the Carter administration, he succeeded. Defense Secretary Harold Brown called reporters in to accuse Reagan of a gross distortion of the facts. As a scientist, I'm offended by Governor Reagan's cavalier attitude toward facts. And as a public official, I'm indignant at his reckless distortions. Brown said the information about the stealth plane would have come out during the next year anyway because its development had been greatly expanded. At the White House, Press Secretary Jody Powell said any implication that the President or the Secretary of Defense acted to damage the security of the country is wrong, and it goes far beyond the acceptable bounds of political partisanship. Campaign Chairman Robert Strauss said Reagan's statement was purely political. It's a kind of political charge and statement that would be made by someone who'd had a very bad political week and wanted to change the subject. And I think it's a 24-hour story, probably. And my, as I gather, it's pretty, pretty well discredited already. But if I, were, I don't blame uh, Governor Reagan. I'd be trying to change the subject, too, after the past week. There's at least one positive aspect of this flap from the Carter campaign point of view. It keeps public attention focused on the contest between Carter and Reagan and not on John Anderson, who continues to be a major worry here. Carter aides would prefer, of course, that all the attention be on Reagan, and they're hoping to shift it back to him by accusing him once again of shooting from the hip. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, the White House. The Reagan camp brought out some big guns today to keep up the attack on stealth. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger spent two hours at Reagan's Virginia estate, then told reporters the use of classified information for political purposes destroys foreign policy. When I was in office, uh, it was considered that this technology was of the uh, was uh, among the most sensitive secrets that we possess, and that it should be preserved with very special uh, precautions. Do you believe it was leaked for political purposes? Uh, I can only note the coincidence in time between its appearance and the political campaign. In Washington, the Republican National Committee assembled a group of retired military leaders who said the stealth leak is a serious blow to American security. And I have never seen anything that approaches the way this administration seeks to use uh, the men and the programs in the Defense Department for uh, their own uh, political purposes. Reagan aides feel they've put Jimmy Carter on the defensive for the first time in this campaign and on an issue of national security, where polls show the president to be weak. The Reagan camp has one other reason to like the stealth controversy. No one has mentioned the Ku Klux Klan for two days. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Washington.
John Anderson's presidential campaign received its first major endorsement today. The policy committee of New York State's Liberal Party voted overwhelmingly to endorse Anderson. Well, that's great news for Anderson, but a blow to the Carter campaign. We have two reports on this. First, Bob Jameson with the Anderson campaign. The committee's vote came after Anderson and his running mate Patrick Lucy met for 90 minutes with key members of the Liberal Party. When the full party endorses the independent ticket next Friday, it will become the first organized political body to do so. But the endorsement will also mean Anderson can drop his effort to get on New York's ballot as an independent and save $200,000 he would have spent fighting legal efforts by the Carter campaign to keep him off the ballot here. Though the Liberal Party has traditionally endorsed the Democratic presidential candidate and gave its place on the ticket to Mr. Carter in 1976, its dissatisfaction with the president has been growing for some time. Raymond Harding, Liberal Party Vice Chairman. We explained to the president that we were not satisfied with his record and performance in office. And since that time, we have seen no specific action by the White House which would in any way alleviate those feelings which... Harding rejected the belief here that the liberal endorsement will only take enough votes away from the president to give New York and perhaps the election to Ronald Reagan. Anderson was delighted with the decision. I need New York. I cannot see a scenario whereby I can win a majority in the Electoral College of 270 votes or more uh, without New York State. The endorsement from New York's Liberal Party comes at the end of a week filled with good news for Anderson. And it comes as he enters the most crucial seven-day period of his four-and-a-half-month-old campaign. The Federal Election Commission decided that Anderson would be eligible for federal funds after the election if he gets at least 5% of the vote in November. The commission 5 to 1 vote means Anderson can now borrow millions with the prospect of the federal money as collateral and bail out his cash-starved campaign. There was good news about Anderson's effort to get on the ballot. By week's end, he had met requirements in 42 states and the District of Columbia. Aides confidently predict he will be on the ballot in all 50 states. But next week is crucial. Anderson must reverse a summer-long decline in the polls to have the 15% standing the League of Women Voters says is necessary to qualify for its debates. The League makes its decision Wednesday, and the debate's national exposure may mean the difference for John Anderson. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in New York. this past week. It comes after days of unsuccessful lobbying by top Carter officials and is a real blow to their campaign. It makes it much harder for the president to win New York State's prize of 41 electoral votes because polls show most people who vote for Anderson would have voted for Mr. Carter. This development, coupled with the Federal Election Commission ruling this week that Anderson is eligible for government campaign funds, has Carter campaign officials worried. But publicly, their main strategy so far has been to ignore Anderson. Not once while he was out campaigning this week did the president mention Anderson's name. Someone sitting in last Tuesday's town meeting in Independence, Missouri, might have thought there were only two men in the race. I don't have any doubt that as the people assess Myself, with good experience and a proven record, representing the Democratic Party, having kept our nation at peace, having helped to unite our country, compared to Governor Reagan and what he has to offer and what the Republicans have to offer, that the people will make the right decision. There were other days this week when the president only mentioned Reagan by inference. But Mr. Carter's aides clearly want the public focus of this campaign to remain on the contest between him and Reagan. Bringing Anderson into the mix, they say, spells trouble. I think the Anderson candidacy is a very badly flawed candidacy in terms of going anywhere. Uh, in terms of taking votes away and being a spoiler, I think it's a very serious thing. The other part of the anti-Anderson strategy, besides ignoring him, is to try to keep him out of the first debate. The president told his political aides this week that if Anderson is included, as now appears likely, then he will not participate. Aides say they'd rather take the heat now for avoiding an appearance with Anderson than see him pick up in the polls as a result of the debate and cost Mr. Carter the election. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, the White House. Well, the president may be trying to ignore John Anderson, but Mr. Carter is engaging in a war of words with his other rival, Ronald Reagan. 
Heidi Schulman following the Reagan campaign reviews all this week's verbal sparring. Reagan's plan called for him to campaign for northern labor votes and blame Jimmy Carter for their economic troubles. But he knocked his own message out of the headlines when he spotted a Jimmy Carter mask in the crowd at the Michigan State Fair. And he's opening his campaign down in the city that gave birth to and is the parent body of the Ku Klux Klan. Again, critics said he was shooting from the hip. And aides were still assessing the damage in the South when Reagan went to New Orleans and Jacksonville. They decided he had to change the subject and believe he regained the offensive by at every stop accusing the president of deliberately leaking information on the secret stealth aircraft. The administration's decision to disclose and then exploit for per political purposes this super secret technology in an effort to blur its dismal defense record is a cynical misuse of power and a clear abuse of the public trust. Aides admit this is still a shakedown period for the staff, and they say they have to be more flexible in seizing opportunities to attack the administration. At midweek, Stu Spencer, who has run campaigns for both Reagan and Gerald Ford, was hastily recruited to try to do that and still keep Reagan out of trouble. I mean to be the president of the American people, the American nation. Today, Reagan delivered a closed-circuit pep talk to volunteers in 27 states. Tomorrow, he begins a five-day trip back into the Great Lakes region. The official campaign claim is that the latest figures on rising producer prices forecast a significant rise in inflation. And Reagan plans a major economic address in Chicago on Tuesday. Heidi Schulman, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Washington. Good evening. The League of Women Voters is expected to announce this week how many candidates will be invited to participate in its first presidential debate. The announcement will follow a new round of national polls, including a Time Magazine survey, which shows President Carter and Ronald Reagan in a dead heat at 39% apiece. John Anderson is a distant third at 15%, but that could be good enough for an invitation to the debates. Not a welcome piece of news at the White House. Here's John Palmer. A senior White House official said today it is clear that the League of Women Voters will invite Anderson to take part in its first debate. The White House also assumes that Reagan will accept in the belief that the political boost which debate exposure might give Anderson will hurt Mr. Carter more than the Republican candidate. The White House still prefers the first debate to be one-on-one -on -one with Reagan, but left open the possibility of compromise. Press Secretary Jody Powell said, we are perfectly willing to participate in a multi-candidate debate, but we feel there has got to be an assurance that there will also be one-on-one -on -one debates. Powell went on to say, there is a growing conclusion here that if we agree to a multi-candidate debate, there would never be one-on-one -on -one debates. White House and Carter campaign officials are becoming increasingly concerned that John Anderson will siphon off enough votes to make Ronald Reagan the winner in a close election this fall. Today, Mr. Carter concentrated on the Jewish vote. He met for an hour with the heads of 34 Jewish organizations asking for their support. After the meeting, spokesman Howard Squadron was asked if the Jewish leaders had been reassured about Mr. Carter's Middle East policy. I think to some extent they were on many issues. Uh, I think that on some issues, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, people left the room uh, still having some concerns. Squadron said the Jewish vote is still up in the air. Regarding the endorsement of John Anderson by the leaders of New York's Liberal Party, a White House official said today that several prominent members of that party plan to repudiate the endorsement and publicly announce support for Mr. Carter. Nevertheless, the endorsement represents a serious setback for the Carter campaign. John Palmer, NBC News, at the White House. That Time Magazine poll showing him at 15% was especially good news for John Anderson since the League of Women Voters has been saying that he must reach that level in national polls to qualify for the debates. More from Bob Jamison with the Anderson campaign. John Anderson campaigned in upstate New York saying he is now confident the League of Women Voters will invite him to its debates. In the three most recent national polls, Anderson is at 15% or better. Now, he told reporters, it is up to the president to join the debates and discuss his record. Uh, I think the leader of a country owes that to his fellow countrymen. And uh, I don't think he should look at it purely in terms of his own personal perceived political advantage. 
Anderson said the weight of public opinion is in favor of a three-man debate and predicted that if the president refuses, that will become a major campaign issue. If the president wants to stonewall it uh, on the subject of uh, recognizing that there is somebody else in this race, uh, I think it could become uh, one of the major issues. And at two campus rallies today, Anderson accused both the president and Ronald Reagan of avoiding the real issues and acting like two tarantulas in a bottle trying to sting each other. So Anderson believes he will be invited to the debates and that he can profit politically whether or not the president participates. If the debates go on as scheduled, Anderson expects a big boost from the national exposure side by side with the president and Ronald Reagan. And if Mr. Carter refuses to debate, Anderson believes he will have an issue that he can exploit. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Albany, New York. Former President Richard Nixon, who had his own troubles with presidential debates against John Kennedy in 1960, appreciates President Carter's position. In an interview with Theodore White to be broadcast tomorrow morning on NBC's Today program, Mr. Nixon talked about the prospects for a three-man debate. Now, I understand why President Carter might not want Anderson. Uh, he believes that Anderson draws more from him than he does from Reagan. Uh, but nevertheless, should he be in or not? It seems to me that one who is going to qualify, as he will, for receiving funds uh, from the uh, Federal Election Commission decision, uh, one who is on the ballot in all 50 states, or virtually every one of the 50 states, uh, one who is getting 10 to 15 percent of the polls, uh, is a legitimate candidate, should be included. If he is not included in the debates, he has no chance whatever to carry any state, let alone to make a difference. And frankly, unless we're going to say that the two-party system is frozen in forever, you realize if we do not allow third-party candidates to be in debates, then we are in effect saying we can only have, from now on out, two parties in the United States. Ronald Reagan today began a five-state tour of the industrial Midwest and Northeast, hitting hard at President Carter's economic policies. In Kokomo, Indiana, which has an unemployment rate of more than 19% because of problems in the automobile industry, Reagan continued to call the current economic situation a depression. A depression, he said, was brought on by President Carter. Reagan is expected to maintain that theme for the next several days, campaigning through areas hard hit by unemployment. The League of Women Voters today invited all three to the first presidential debate, Carter, Reagan, and Anderson. But a Carter spokesman said the president would not participate. Details from Steve Delaney. We made our decision to indeed invite Congressman John Anderson. The league's decision was based on a finding that John Anderson has substantial public support, averaging a little over 15 percent in four national polls taken since the 26th of August. We have now extended an invitation to Congressman Anderson to participate in the debate series we have notified the representatives of the major party candidates and we hope to have a meeting with the representatives of all three candidates invited to participate in our debates tomorrow. Ronald Reagan campaigning today in Chicago welcomed the decision. I'm going to be there, that's his problem. The ladies have decided that Anderson is a viable candidate and I've always said if he was he certainly should be included and uh, I'll be there. But in Washington, Carter campaign chairman Robert Strauss turned down the invitation, still insisting on a debate between Carter and Reagan only. Since Governor Reagan and the League of Women Voters have refused to even discuss the scheduling of a one-on-one -on -one debate, we are convinced that acceptance of this invitation would preclude any chance of such a one-on-one -on -one debate, and therefore we must respectfully decline. The Carter people are trying to eliminate Anderson as a factor in the election and simply don't want to give him the exposure that may increase his following at the president's expense. The Reagan people who want Anderson in for just that purpose are now waiting to see whether Strauss shows up at the League of Women Voters meeting tomorrow that he promised to attend. If Strauss does appear, some Reagan advisors believe that what he said today is simply a bargaining position and not a final rejection of the idea of a three-way debate. But as it stands now, it will be Reagan and Anderson in Baltimore on the 21st of September. Steve Delaney, NBC News, Washington. For John Anderson, the league's decision to include him in the first debate was the best news of the fall campaign. 
Bob Jamison was covering Anderson in New Jersey when the candidate received word of his invitation. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased, you know. Uh, I, I am very happy. With that bit of understatement, Anderson accepted the League of Women Voters' invitation and its promise of the national exposure he has been counting on to make his candidacy serious. Anderson said he will show up even if the president does not, but he very much wants to see Mr. Carter on the same Baltimore stage September 21st. I simply cannot believe that the president of the United States uh, would decline uh, the opportunity that he has now been given. Uh, to debate the issues before the American people. I'm very confident that he will not disappoint me, that he will be there on the, on the 21st. Now, with the Carter campaign announcement, Anderson will try to exploit the president's non-participation as a major issue. At a rally before the good news, Anderson accused Mr. Carter of running away from his record. That record, Anderson said, makes debates this fall even more important. Anderson is convinced that today's decision by the League of Women Voters means his campaign has made it, even without the president's participation in Baltimore. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Hackensack, New Jersey. President Carter and House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill today called John Anderson a creation of the media. The president told New Jersey newspaper editors that Anderson never won a primary, not even in his home state, adding, he hasn't had a convention and he doesn't have a party. O'Neill accused the news media of building up a third-party candidate for the sake of controversy. Ronald Reagan today offered his plans for the economy if he's elected president. As Chris Wallace reports, Reagan is counting heavily on government spending cuts, $195 billion over five years. Critics had said the only way Reagan could cut taxes, increase defense spending, and balance the budget was with mirrors. But the program he laid out to a business group was based on old-fashioned Republican budget cuts. We must move boldly, decisively, and quickly to control the runaway growth of federal spending. Using Senate budget projections, Reagan said he will eliminate 2% of federal spending in fiscal 1981, or $13 billion, a 5% cut, or $39 billion in 1983, and a 7% cut, $64 billion in 1985. Reagan said he could do all this without cuts in any current programs, by eliminating waste and fraud and vetoing new projects. Actually, I believe we can do even better. My goal will be to bring about spending reductions of 10% by fiscal year 1984. Reagan's program also includes fewer federal regulations to encourage economic growth, faster depreciation schedules to stimulate business investment, and what had previously been his economic centerpiece, a 30% income tax cut over three years. Aides now say the cut would simply balance tax increases already scheduled for next year. Reagan would increase defense spending more than 5% per year in real dollars. As for unemployment and inflation, the plan offers no quick fixes, and it would take at least three years to balance the budget. I'm asked, can we do it immediately? Well, my answer is no. It took Mr. Carter three and a half years of hard work to get us into this economic mess. It'll take time to get us out. The Reagan plan hit a rut before it was even announced. Last night, after meeting with Reagan, former President Ford was unaware the plan called for a three-year tax cut, and he opposed it. I don't think at this stage we can see down the road what the economic situation will be in 36 months. Reagan's new economic program is much more traditional than his earlier statements, but it is still controversial. A key supporter has doubts about his tax cuts, and there are bound to be doubts whether Reagan can really eliminate all that waste and fraud. The speech that was supposed to answer all the questions hasn't. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Chicago. President Carter, campaigning in New Jersey today, immediately attacked Reagan's economic plan and defended his administration's handling of that secret airplane called Stealth. John Palmer, covering the Carter campaign. Mr. Carter, campaigning in the working-class neighborhoods of Perth Amboy, New Jersey, voiced sharp criticism of Governor Reagan's economic plan, labeling Reagan's support for a big three-year tax cut a very serious mistake. It means tremendous tax cuts for the rich, and it means a devastating blow to the American economy and high inflation for the average working family in this country. Mr. Carter said the plan was so bad that Reagan and other Republicans will abandon it eventually. 
Earlier, the president, wearing a hard hat and protective goggles, toured a new $130 million steel plant built in part with the help of federal loan guarantees. Mr. Carter said the plant is an example of the kind of industrial revitalization policy he has proposed for the 1980s. At the end of his day of campaigning, the president was anxious to defend his administration against charges by Reagan that defense secrets have been leaked for political purposes. Mr. Carter said statements that his administration has leaked details of the top secret stealth aircraft are false. It's obvious that the Republicans have taken what is a major benefit to our country and tried to play cheap politics with it by alleging that we have violated our nation's security. The president said no impropriety had taken place because only the existence of the plane had been revealed, not any secret details of its performance. And he said the previous Republican administrations had not even classified the project. John Palmer, NBC News, with the president in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. When President Carter announced his economic revitalization program recently, Irving R. Levine measured the effects of its tax cuts on a number of Americans with different incomes. Now he's gone back to the same group to compare the Reagan plan with the president's proposal. Americans at the low end of the income scale would benefit least from the Reagan 10% tax cut. Example, Margarita Fletcher, a hotel worker, earns $7,000 a year, pays no income tax, but does pay Social Security taxes. Under the Reagan plan, Mrs. Fletcher would continue to get $700 a year in earned income tax credit. Under the Carter plan, $770. The Reagan proposal favors those who make more money. Example, a family of four with $15,000 a year income. Under the Reagan plan, a tax cut of $150. Under the Carter plan, a tax cut of $78 to compensate for the coming Social Security tax increase. Another example, Roger and Mary Hayden earn $45,000 a year. Under the Reagan plan, taxpayers in their bracket get a tax cut of $613. Under the Carter plan, $158. And as owners of a small business, the Haydens, like other Americans in business, would do a little better under the Reagan proposals for tax write-offs on new equipment. President Carter charges that the Reagan tax cut would benefit the rich and hurt the poor. The Reagan people don't argue the point. They say that it's only fair that the more taxes you pay, the bigger your tax cut should be. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Washington. Another presidential poll in July, Ronald Reagan led President Carter by 20 points in California. In the California poll out today, Reagan's lead has been cut to 10 points, 39 to 29. John Anderson slipped a bit from 20 to 18 percent in the same survey. Good evening. It looks tonight as though Jimmy Carter will be the candidate who isn't there when Ronald Reagan and John Anderson debate in Baltimore later this month. And there is talk that there may be an empty chair on the stage to represent the president's refusal to debate. This came out after a meeting at the Washington office of the League of Women's Voters, the sponsors of the debate. Details from Steve Delaney. The Reagan and Anderson campaign sent senior staff men to today's meeting with the League of Women Voters, but the Carter camp sent staff counsel Tim Smith, not campaign chief Robert Strauss. The Reagan people proposed a series of two-man debates in which all three candidates would eventually face one another. That would be followed by a single three-way confrontation. The Carter staff turned that down. The League of Women Voters proposed an initial three-way debate, then a series of one-on-ones. Again, the Carter staff said no. When the meeting broke up, all parties defended their positions. I'm afraid that the impasse which existed when we met with the candidates' representatives on August 26th remains the impasse with which we left one another today, and I regret that very deeply. We believe that, uh, first, there should be a direct one-on-one -on -one opportunity for comparison between the major party nominees, and thereafter that uh, the president would be willing to participate in, in multi-candidate debates. Uh, for them to advance as a condition to any debate, that they have a one-on-one -on -one before the league's multi-candidate debate puts an impossible condition. They will uh, play, but only under their rules, and only on their court, and only if they're captain. There will be an empty chair for the president at Baltimore's convention center on September 21st when Reagan and Anderson have their debate. 
Their staffs are now working out other arrangements for that, still hoping the president will change his mind and be there after all. Steve Delaney, NBC News, Washington. Some of President Carter's advisors know their candidate will take a lot of criticism for breaking his earlier promise to debate, a promise he made after Anderson had announced his independent candidacy. But the White House feels that to engage in a three-way debate might be even more harmful politically. John Palmer has the view from the White House. The White House today accused Governor Reagan of hiding behind John Anderson and refusing to agree to a one-on-one -on -one debate with the president. For his part, Mr. Carter said he was sticking by his refusal to join a three-way debate with Reagan and Anderson without assurance of a one-on-one -on -one debate with Reagan first. It's obvious to me, and I think to almost everyone else in this country, that the two people who have a chance to be elected as president of the nominee of the Republican Party, Governor Reagan, and myself as a nominee of the Democratic Party. That is what I want. And if the other two of the many candidates decide to debate as a, as a Republican duo to debate each other, that's perfectly all right with me. On another subject, the president again accused Governor Reagan of making false statements about the Carter record. Today in Cleveland, Governor Reagan, without one shred of supporting evidence, charged that the, that the policies of this administration, and I quote, discourage the discovery and production of energy in this country. Governor Reagan is wrong. He's again made an accusation without checking the facts. Mr. Carter said coal production is at an all-time high and that crude oil production has increased with 75% more drilling rigs in operation this year than there were four years ago. Mr. Carter said he would continue to, in his words, set the record straight against what he termed Reagan's misrepresentations. John Palmer, NBC News, at the White House. And out on the campaign trail today, Reagan, quite predictably, echoed a charge made earlier this year by Senator Edward Kennedy. Reagan accused Mr. Carter of hiding in the Rose Garden. Chris Wallace is with the Reagan campaign. Reagan was very cautious today in reacting to the debate flap repeatedly refusing to answer questions. Wait for the statement, fellas. It wouldn't be fair. Wait for the statement. Late today, a written statement was released. It was a strong one. Noting that four years ago, Mr. Carter favored debates, Reagan said, the new Jimmy Carter would rather campaign in the safety and isolation of the Rose Garden instead of submitting himself and his sorry record to the scrutiny of the American people. And John Anderson's tactic in all of this is to take the high road since he's the beneficiary of most of the anti-Carter feeling on the matter of the debates. But Anderson, while not attacking the president directly, did take the line that the president himself couldn't have done such a thing, that it must have been his aides acting for him. Bob Jamison is with the Anderson campaign. Anderson's usually hot rhetoric about the president was restrained. He refused to criticize Mr. Carter personally for rejecting the debates or the president's characterization of Anderson as a media creation. But Anderson did criticize the president's handlers, particularly Robert Strauss. And he is clearly saying, now folks, this, this is all just a political thing. The debates themselves are not all that important. Uh, Reagan is trying to get a little advantage. You can't blame us for trying to get a little advantage. And, you know, if the American people suffer in the process, so be it. But, you know, this is, this is straight politics. Uh, I think the president ought to be above that. Anderson predicted voters would feel they have been robbed if Mr. Carter doesn't change his mind. There is something more fundamental than politics in the debate question, he argued. The people's right to hear the president personally defend his record. Anderson continued to take the high road in other California appearances today, this radio program in Los Angeles. The president, he argued, is suffering from bad advice. Anderson's aides want him to stay on the high road to avoid mean criticism of the president so that Mr. Carter will have room to change his mind about the debates. But most of all, they do not want Anderson to appear to be the one using the debates for political purposes. Bob Jamison. It was a kind of up and down day today for Ronald Reagan as he toured the Northeast looking for support from union members. At one point he was warmly received, but at another heckled. Chris Wallace was with the Reagan campaign. Today Reagan saw the promise and the problems involved in his pursuit of blue collar workers. Arriving for a breakfast meeting with Buffalo labor leaders, Reagan encountered some 50 union pickets who said he is anti-labor. We want Carter! We want Carter! 
While Reagan went inside, Press Secretary Lynn Nossiger told the men they were acting. Later, Reagan said they just had their facts wrong. How can I be against labor? For 25 years or so, I led the negotiations of my own union. I was six times president of that union. Reagan went on to the port of Buffalo, along with longshoreman President Thomas Gleason, who said the Republican has some good ideas. Here, Reagan saw a sign that said he would kill OSHA, the federal agency that enforces worker safety. No, but I'll tell you what I would do. I would reform OSHA so it could do the job better in industry instead of futzing around the way they have. Later in Erie, Pennsylvania, Reagan received a warm welcome. He continued his attack on Jimmy Carter's energy policy and suggested the president decided not to debate to avoid defending his record. You don't suppose that that's one of the reasons why he's found an excuse for not debating, do you? That he wouldn't like to chat, compare these facts face to face? Class. Finally, a mixture of old memories and new politics. Reagan touring a General Electric plant, the company he represented back in the 50s. The Reagan camp has long felt that it can win over blue-collar Democrats, that the conservative social views added to Mr. Carter's economic problems make them a prime target. And they'd say that everything they saw this week in the industrial Midwest confirms that strategy. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Erie, Pennsylvania. President Carter said today that he's too busy to answer each and every charge from Republican Ronald Reagan. Mr. Carter said he can't take a three-month vacation from being president in order to run a campaign. He did find a moment today, however, to take a little time off to give his troops a pep talk. And John Palmer has that story. You and you to them. In a visit to his national campaign headquarters in Washington, Mr. Carter lashed out at those who he said attach a political connection to most everything he does. When we have successes, and I think they are notable, in international matters, in defense matters, in domestic affairs, the Republicans are going to claim that we had those successes, not for the benefit of our nation, but just for some political benefit for us. As for his campaign for re-election, Mr. Carter said he felt things are going well. By Anthony Casamento. This afternoon, the president joined several hundred guests, many of them Italian-Americans, in the White House Rose Garden to watch as 59-year-old Anthony Casamento was awarded the Medal of Honor. For Casamento, it was the culmination of a 37-year struggle to be awarded the nation's highest military decoration. In 1942, as a Marine corporal, Casamento took over a machine gun position and held his ground on the island of Guadalcanal after all his comrades had been killed or seriously wounded. Casamento was shot 14 times. On several occasions over the years, he picketed the White House to draw attention to the bureaucratic red tape that repeatedly denied him his medal. But today, acting on the recommendation of a Navy Board of Examiners, President Carter awarded the medal to Casamento, calling him a true hero. His valor reminds us of our nation's reserves of determination and strength and courage. And his sufferings remind us of the horrors of war. Who say can you see? There have been published charges that the White House pressured the Navy Board into approving the medal for Casamento, hoping for political benefit with the Italian-American community in this election year, a charge the White House vigorously denied. As for Casamento, he insists he's not bitter about the long delay in getting the award. He said it was just a bureaucratic mess. John Palmer, NBC News, at the White House. Among the complexities of this political season is the fact that three major candidates for the presidency have put out long and detailed plans on what to do about the economy. If you are confused by these plans, you are not alone. Here's Tom Pettit. Fifty-three days before the election, there's confusion in Buffalo, in Kokomo, in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, and Erie, Pennsylvania. I think everybody in the whole United States is confused. The confusion is about the candidates' competing plans to cure illnesses of the American economy. We've got to begin to rebuild the industrial base of this country. We I must don't balance the, the budget, Buffaloes reduce tax rates, and restore our defenses. These what are we the need is a carefully planned, targeted, workable, 
revitalization program for America. Be it Reagan's tax cut plan, Anderson's gas tax plan, or a Carter tax incentive plan, many who do not understand a plan do understand the problem. You can sell your house, you can buy a house, you can do nothing. You know, you go to the market, you see, you know, the price is so high. The people, they have big family, they, you know, they suffer. When President Carter visits a plant like this one in New Jersey, it is part of a very long-range debate over how to fix inflation and the whole economy. That's a central issue in this campaign. But so far, at least the dialogue has been both distant and not very enlightening either. It is a rather patent political ploy on the part of the president uh, to say, here's a new steel plant that I've given you. We don't need any more doses of Carter's eight or ten point programs to fix or fine-tune the economy. The so-called Reagan-Kemp-Roth tax cut is a very, very serious mistake. We found even people who listen to candidates are uncertain about what Reagan, Carter, or Anderson would do. There's a difference, but I don't know what it is. They give a lot of promises, but it never materializes after they get in there, you know. People are confused and skeptical about economic plans from politicians. They have grown accustomed to hearing economic plans which don't work. Tom Pettit, NBC News, Perth Amboy News. When the day began for Ronald Reagan, it looked like a day of light campaigning, a visit with friends, and a speech tonight. But somewhere along the way, as Heidi Schulman reports from Washington, the Reagan camp changed strategies. Reagan is due to make a statement on Iran at this hour, a subject an aide said earlier today he would avoid. But now we are told he has decided he should make his position clear. Reagan has refused all along to reveal how he'd free the hostages, insisting he doesn't know all the options. But earlier this week in Milwaukee, he blamed President Carter for allowing them to be taken. And he charged the president's actions since the embassy takeover have all been grandstanding. Reagan tried to put Jimmy Carter on the defensive on other issues, on the economy. Mr. Carter's economic failures are an assault on the hopes and dreams of millions of American families. On energy. The world and the nation cannot withstand the continuation of current policies. And on the debates. He's using Mr. Anderson as the excuse that he won't debate. Well, now, I don't find Mr. Anderson too much to be afraid of. But then in the primaries, he found Teddy Kennedy was too much for him to debate also. But Reagan was carefully shielded from explaining his own proposals. They tell me, they tell me I got a wave, I can't shake hands anymore, we're running out of time. Before an eerie Pennsylvania factory tour, one writer told a traveling reporter Reagan advance men threatened to throw him out if he tried to ask a question. Reagan's image makers want him identified with blue collar and ethnic voters. He was mobbed as he walked along Lithuanian Plaza on Chicago's south side. He met with blacks in Cleveland. Tonight, Reagan had planned to dine with Italian Americans, but when President Carter changed his plans to also arrive at the dinner early, Reagan backed out. Now he'll stay in his suite before his speech until the president leaves, that way to avoid a confrontation. Heidi Schulman, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Washington. Until the president leaves, that way to avoid a confrontation. Heidi Schulman, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Washington. President Carter is only making two campaign stops today, both tonight in Washington. He'll speak at that Italian-American Foundation meeting and attend a concert. Judy Woodruff reports on the president's week from the White House. Despite the fact that the election is less than two months away, the president made only one campaign trip this week. He spent three and a half hours in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, where at a steel plant dedication, he attacked Reagan's tax cut proposals. But a glance at his schedule for the rest of the week shows clearly why a sitting president doesn't have to campaign. I'm very pleased to be signing into law today this very important legislation. That was Monday when reporters were invited in to watch the president sign a military pay bill that he had originally opposed. Today in Cleveland, Governor Reagan, without one shred of supporting evidence, charged that the, that the policies of this administration, and I quote, discourage the discovery and production of energy in this country. Governor Reagan is wrong. That was Wednesday when reporters were invited in to hear the president dispute his Republican opponent. Because in the past, because of racial discrimination and other factors, you have not had your constitutional rights 
honored. That was Thursday when reporters were invited to a reception the president gave for blacks and Hispanics involved in broadcasting. And that was Friday, a busy day when the president awarded Anthony Casamento the Congressional Medal of Honor, stood before the cameras to announce a modest increase in grain shipments to Poland, and dropped by his campaign headquarters to complain that he didn't have time to campaign. I have to conduct the affairs of our country on a daily basis. I can't take a three-month vacation from being president in order to run a campaign to attack opponents but this week, the president attacked both Reagan and Anderson, calling him a creation of the press. As for Mr. Carter's limited travel schedule, aides deny any deliberate Rose Garden strategy. They say they're simply saving money so the president can travel a lot in October. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, the White House. John Anderson, the man President Carter is trying to ignore, got more good news today. Anderson was officially endorsed by New York's Liberal Party. Bob Jamison has more on the Anderson campaign. This man is smiling because his independent presidential campaign, on the brink of disaster two weeks ago, has found new life and recaptured some of its old potential. Even that lonely rendition of Hail to the Chief is terribly premature, despite the positive developments in John Anderson's campaign. The most important came on Tuesday, when he got what he has wanted and needed badly since becoming an independent candidate, an invitation to the League of Women Voters debates. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased, you know. Uh, I, I am very happy. Because the decision gave Anderson new credibility. The president's refusal to join the debates, an issue he tried to exploit all week. He betrays the same attitude that Mr. Strauss has, uh, and that is that this is all politics. I don't believe that the American people will look at this event in those terms. Uh, there's something more important to them than just the politics. There's something more important to them than Jimmy Carter being reelected in 1980, and that is their right to make a choice. While Anderson tried to restrain his criticism of the president so he wouldn't look like the one playing politics with the debates, he also tried to shed his summer-long calculated pattern of cautious campaigning. Aides have criticized him for some time because he has not been the straightforward campaigner that got so much attention during the primaries. But in California this week, he tried to become the old Anderson. He voiced his opposition to the MX missile at the TRW company, which has a $50 million contract and 200 jobs dependent on MX development. I just happen to believe that's not the best way to spend $65 billion. If we want to protect this country and its land-based missile force, I think there's a better, there's a cheaper way to do it. But if there is a new old Anderson now, there is also this week the same old concern about his candidacy. That with a few more good weeks like this one, he may be just significant enough by November 4th to elect Ronald Reagan. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign. In Iran, a date has now been set for the issue of the American hostages to be brought before a full meeting of the parliament, and that date is Tuesday. The Speaker of the Parliament said today that on Tuesday there will be what he called substantial discussion of the hostage issue. Also today, one Iranian deputy suggested that the Parliament's conditions for the release of the hostages be in line with those made two days ago by the Ayatollah Khomeini. As the hostages spent their 316th day in captivity, American officials acknowledge there seemed to be more Iranian interest in the issue recently. But as Marvin Kalb reports, the State Department is reacting cautiously. Officials here and at the White House are taking an extremely cautious approach, saying only that through diplomatic contacts, they are exploring the latest statements from Iran to see whether there is now the basis for a deal. No one is sure, but everyone recognizes that for the first time since the hostages were seized last November, Iran is actually focusing on the problem, and the pace of diplomacy has been accelerated. In the past week, for example, Prime Minister Ali Rajai has said that Iran would be ready to discuss the hostage problem if the United States would repent. Then, the Ayatollah Khomeini spelled out his terms for releasing the hostages, significantly omitting his earlier demand for an American apology. Now, the Parliament agrees to a public debate which could start as soon as this Tuesday. It may be that the Parliament will add new conditions or restore some of the old ones, but the prevailing view here seems to be that the time for a new start with Iran has finally arrived. 
One reason for the administration's caution is that the hostage issue, if successfully handled, could be a political boom for President Carter. If bungled, however, it could help deprive him of re-election. Marvin Kalb, NBC News, the State Department. The Ayatollah's list of demands has prompted Ronald Reagan to discuss the hostage crisis in more specific terms than he has before. Chris Wallace has this report. In the past, Reagan has refused to state how he would end the Iranian crisis, saying that as a candidate, he didn't know all the president's options. I think the less said about any of this, the better until we know whether we're going to get them back. But last night, Reagan was very specific on each of Ayatollah Khomeini's four demands. We can and should agree to unfreezing the Iranian assets now held by us, cancellation of any and all claims against Iran, and non-intervention in Iran's domestic affairs. The fourth point is the matter of the Shah's property, and this cannot be confiscated without due process of law. And that, of course, means bringing suit through the courts. Aid say Reagan was specific because he felt Khomeini's conditions were specific and encouraging. They say Reagan was trying to take the hostage situation out of politics, telling the Iranians not to wait for a better deal after the election. Now I want to assure the American people that I will not make these negotiations a partisan issue in the campaign. I also pledge that if elected, I will observe the terms of an agreement. But for all the talk of being above politics, Reagan aides say privately that last night's statement was very good politics. They saw it as a way to get ahead of the president on Iran, to tell voters that Democrats aren't the only ones who want to get the hostages out. If Mr. Carter works out a settlement, they hope statements like last night's will limit the political damage. On the other hand, if the Iranian situation falls apart again, Reagan aides feel they have not hemmed themselves in. They expressly reserved Reagan's right to talk about the hostages. One aide saying, Iran is not a partisan issue now, but we can't say what will happen in the future. Chris Wallace, NBC News, at Reagan headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Good evening. President Carter said today that some of the recent statements by officials in Iran might very well lead to resolution of the imprisonment of the American hostages. The president said the problem might be resolved in the future, but he didn't say when. Mr. Carter said that while making his first campaign swing through the state of Texas. Judy Woodruff was there. Ladies and gentlemen, the president At a town meeting in Corpus Christi, the president launched a string of sharp attacks on Ronald Reagan. First, for speaking out in response to new conditions laid down by Iranian leaders for the release of the American hostages. They are making statements in Iran that might very well lead to a resolution of this problem in the future. The last thing that any political candidate ought to do, including an incumbent president, is to get into a negotiation with the Iranian authorities through public statements or through the news media. The president suggested a Reagan victory would set back the struggle for civil rights, said Reagan's economic proposals were a disaster, and added... You've probably noticed that the campaign staff of my Republican opponent has put him under wraps because when he has spoken on his own the last few days he's gotten himself in trouble. When you're in the White House in the Oval Office as president that's where the most difficult questions come perhaps to any human being on earth and you've got to be able to respond accurately in a way that doesn't embarrass you personally and does not embarrass our nation. But in Houston, Mr. Carter was asked about an embarrassment in his own campaign, the leave of absence taken by campaign manager Tim Kraft because of an investigation of drug charges. Tim has denied the charges, you know, says he's completely innocent. And I think the investigation uh, will show that that's the case. The president added, however, that Kraft was right to step down rather than become a focus of controversy in the campaign. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, Houston. Ronald Reagan will be following the president through Texas, which is a critically important state to both the Reagan and the Carter campaigns. But Reagan's day began on Capitol Hill as he became the centerpiece of an unprecedented gathering of Republican candidates. Chris Wallace was there. It was a day filled with stagecraft, starting with Reagan's arrival by helicopter on the Washington Mall. The point, to dramatize the campaign's team theme that Republicans in the White House and Congress would get things done, not fight each other, as they say the Democrats have. Reagan went to the Capitol, where along with running mate George Bush and House and Senate leaders, 
He signed a list of goals he pledged Republicans would achieve within one year. George and I are both very proud to, to do this and think that it's something that's long overdue. The goals include an across-the-board income tax reduction, cuts in waste and fraud from non-defense spending, more jobs through private investment, and a, quote, margin of safety in national defense. Reagan then took his list to the west front of the Capitol to a display of party unity that a Reagan TV crew taped for possible campaign commercials. Flanked by hundreds of congressmen and candidates, Reagan said the divisions in the Democratic Party have created legislative chaos. Never before in history have so many proposals from the White House been ignored and defeated in the Congress. Never before has a president been more remote from the members of his own party. Reagan listed Mr. Carter's failures, and Iran was one of them. Although he said this weekend he would not make it a partisan issue. And the continued suffering of our hostages in Iran for nearly a year bears stark testimony to the decline of American prestige. The American people are now entitled to ask, what went wrong? Reagan even had an ending for the day, asking the politicians and crowd to join in singing, God Bless America. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign at the Capitol. The presidential campaign heated up a bit today. President Carter was in Atlanta talking to a black audience, and he accused Ronald Reagan, his Republican challenger, of raising the stirrings of hate. And the reference clearly meant racial hatred. Mr. Carter also accused Reagan of using code words like states' rights. Judy Woodruff was with the Carter campaign. The president went south to defend his home base from a Republican incursion. In Atlanta, surrounded by some of his black supporters, he tried to put Reagan on the defensive on civil rights. You've seen in this campaign the stirrings of hate and the rebirth of code words like states' rights in a speech in Mississippi and a campaign reference to the Ku Klux Klan relating to the South. That is a message that creates a cloud on the political horizon. Yes. Hatred has no place in this country. Racism has no place in this country. A few minutes earlier, the president had said he didn't think the Klan would play a significant role in the campaign. But then he brought it up again in another reference to Reagan. He's now been deprived by his staff of the opportunity to speak out on the issues. He didn't do too well in the Ku Klux Klan or China, as you know. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, Press Secretary Jody Powell denied that the president was calling Reagan a racist. But he said there are differences between the two men on the issue of civil rights. In a speech text handed to reporters, Mr. Carter expanded his attack on Reagan, accusing him of opposing the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But in giving the speech, he strayed from the text. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, with the Carter campaign in South Carolina. Reagan says he originally opposed some parts of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, a landmark piece of legislation which produced major advances in the rights of minorities. But Reagan said he is now satisfied with the act and would like to see it better. Chris Wallace was with the Reagan campaign when it got the news of the president's attack, and here is his report. Reagan was campaigning in Texas this afternoon when he learned of the president's attack. Reagan aides said Mr. Carter had made a serious mistake, and the candidate drove the point home. It's well, harmful and it's shameful because uh, uh, whether we're on the opposite side or not, we ought to be trying to pull the country together, not tear it apart. Reagan conceded he once opposed the Civil Rights Act, but said he changed his mind years ago. Ironically, this came on a day when Reagan was courting the Mexican-American minority in Texas like an ardent suitor riding on a launch through San Antonio, serenaded by mariachi bands. Mexican-Americans comprise more than 10% of the Texas electorate and usually vote Democratic. But the Republicans are conceding nothing this time. Reagan told one crowd the president had imposed the biggest single tax increase ever on American workers. And he linked economic problems to his favorite new issue. And what is his answer to all this misery? He refuses to engage in the kind of debate the overwhelming majority of Americans want spends his time puttering around the rose garden. Later in Harlingen, Texas, Reagan and wife Nancy rode in a parade celebrating Mexican Independence Day. Reagan called for a new policy toward Mexico, including an expanded agreement to allow Mexicans to come to the U.S. for work. 
document the undocumented workers and make them legal coming into our country with a visa to come here and be a part for whatever length of time they want to stay. Four years ago, Jimmy Carter got 87% of the Mexican-American vote and still barely won Texas. They can organize and say if 30% of Hispanics go Republican this time, so will the state's 26 electoral votes. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Texas. The Reagan-Carter race, too close to call at the moment. The survey taken last weekend around the country shows two points only, separating Governor Reagan and President Carter with Congressman Anderson at 15% consider his Republican opponent to be a racist. Mr. Carter was questioned closely about remarks he made in Atlanta on Tuesday in which he didn't mention Ronald Reagan by name but accused him by implication of using racial code words. The president said in Atlanta that hate and racism have no place in this country. Today Mr. Carter said he does not think Reagan is running a campaign of hatred and racism. More on the press conference from Judy Woodruff. The president opened his news conference boasting of his administration's recent achievements in domestic and foreign policy, but almost immediately he was hit with questions about his attack earlier this week on Ronald Reagan, his suggestion that Reagan is running a campaign of hatred and racism. No, I do not think he's uh, running a campaign of racism or hatred, and I think my campaign is very moderate in its tone. I try to discuss the issues, and I do not... Uh, in indulge in attacking personally the integrity of my opponents and and i hope that i never shall but reporters didn't let it go at that after he said he didn't think the issue of racism had any place in the campaign the president was reminded that it was he who brought it up in a speech this week and a member of the carter cabinet who first mentioned the ku klux klan mr carter did not look comfortable as he answered the only thing that i said governor reagan injected into the campaign was the use of the words states rights in a speech in Mississippi. I, I, I hate here on, on national tel television to, to go through the, the procedure again. What happened was that the Ku Klux Klan endorsed Governor Reagan and stated that the Republican convention could have been written by a Klansman. Governor Reagan subsequently rejected wisely and properly any endorsement by the Ku Klux Klan. That was what injected the Klan into the presidential race. I regret it. I wish it had not been done. I would like to see it eliminated from the presidential race. I do not blame Governor Reagan at all for the fact that that endorsement was made, and I admire him for rejecting the Klan endorsement. Mr. Carter was not asked about his refusal to join a three-way debate with Reagan and Anderson this weekend. But he said he'd be glad to debate Reagan alone, anytime, any place, including the White House. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, at the White House. The first presidential debate begins on Sunday night when Reagan and independent candidate John Anderson square off for a one-hour debate. The League of Women Voters today told reporters how the debate would work. and Robert Hager has the story. Inside Baltimore's convention center, workers were getting ready, putting out seats for the audience arranging cameras, setting up the stage, but not setting up an empty chair for the missing President Carter. The league decided against that after it got a lot of complaints from the Carter camp. Carter Mondale lawyer Tim Smith called several times to complain to the league's executive director, Harriet Henches. And Baltimore's mayor, William Donald Schaefer, a Carter man, bombarded the league with objections. I objected very strenuously to an empty chair. It takes away from the debate, second of all, uh, they invited people. They weren't ordered to be here. They were asked to come. And just because someone didn't come doesn't mean you try to embarrass him. The panel for the debate was named today. Public Broadcasting's Bill Moyers will moderate. Others are Jane Bryant Quinn of Newsweek, Carol Loomis of Fortune, and Soma Golden of the New York Times, all economics specialists. Daniel Greenberg, a syndicated columnist who covers energy. Lee May, an urban affairs reporter for the Los Angeles Times. And Charles Cordry of the Baltimore Sun. Cordry, who's been writing military news for 30 years, mused today over how to frame the one question each panelist will probably get. But you mainly you want to try to find something that's not terribly complex and that the candidates in answering uh, can shed some light on for the benefit of the public. The league said everybody was asked to be a panelist accepted, except for one unidentified woman who declined because of a schedule conflict. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. 
John Anderson's campaign rolled on today. He got some very important news from the Supreme Court, which ruled that the state of Ohio can't keep him off the November ballot. Anderson also filed enough petitions to get on the ballot in South Carolina, which means he only has to file in New Hampshire and Arizona to be on all 50 state ballots. The first of the League of Women Voters presidential debates takes place on Sunday night, and today two candidates, the president won't come, were boning up on the issues. Ronald Reagan was sitting in the late summer sunshine at his rented home in the Virginia Hunt country, going over position papers on a wide range of domestic matters with advisors. Well, John Anderson was in his congressional office on Capitol Hill doing some telephoning and some study and discussing the debate with his aides. The contest takes place in Baltimore, and Tom Pettit has gone there for a look. Baltimore is the perfect spot for holding two-thirds of a great debate. It is interesting, but not very exciting. The decay of an old industrial city struggling to renew itself. Baltimore lusts after national respectability, as it used to thirst after national bow beer. Mayor Schaefer went all out to get national publicity by bringing the debate here. Free rickshaw rides for reporters and other goodies, all in anticipation of Live from Baltimore, Sunday night, starring John Anderson and Ronald Reagan, with Bill Moyers and a supporting cast of six. We expect familiar phrases. America needs a tax rate cut. I want to put the brakes on runaway federal spending. Where? I want to know where he's going to cut. you got to be specific. No political reporters are on the show. No presidents, no pizzazz. Baltimore is familiar with political influence and public debate. Sometimes more than 50,000 people go to see discussions. So what do they expect of Reagan and Anderson? I expect to hear a lot of rhetoric. I think the basic issue to, our, to myself and everybody else is the economy. I don't know if they can say anything that's going to make me vote for them. I'd like to see action rather than promises. I guess I'm mainly looking for a, kind of a, a personal quality and a character. As a debater, Jimmy Carter obviously is not in this league. But he isn't playing ball with the League of Women Voters either. And he probably won't debate both Reagan and Anderson unless he gets badly hurt sometime during the final 46 days of the race. Tom Pettit, NBC News, Baltimore. In presidential politics, it was a week of road shows, preparations for tomorrow night's debate, and if not mudslinging, at least some dirt dusting among the candidates. President Carter focused a good bit of his campaigning this week on the minority vote. Bill Lynch with the Carter campaign. The president took his campaign on the road early in the week, starting in Texas with appeals to blacks, Hispanics, and oil men. In Houston, he made his first direct effort to get support from homosexuals. The White House made sure gay activist Lee Harrington was on hand to meet the president at the airport. That trip also brought an about face in his outlook for getting the hostages out of Iran. In Corpus Christi, the president sounded upbeat. So they are making statements in Iran that might very well lead to a resolution of this problem in the future. But the next morning in Atlanta, after Secretary of State Muskie cautioned against such optimism, Mr. Carter retreated. We don't have any prospect at this time for an early resolution of the issue. The week's biggest campaign flap over Ronald Reagan and racism came during Mr. Carter's speech to Southern black leaders at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church. You've seen in this campaign the stirrings of hate and the rebirth of code words like states' rights in a speech in Mississippi in a campaign reference to the Ku Klux Klan relating to the South. Racism has no place in this country. Despite efforts by spokesman Jody Powell and later Mr. Carter himself to deny any implication that Reagan is a racist, the issue did not go away. At his Thursday news conference, the president was clearly defensive about it. I would hope that from now on, after this news conference, that we could leave out references to allegations that anybody thinks that I'm a racist or that any of the other candidates in the race uh, for president are racist. I don't believe they are, and I believe it ought to be dropped. But the very next day, the Carter campaign placed this ad in several black newspapers, saying the Republicans want to reverse black gains in judicial appointments, fair employment, and social programs. Also this week, the Carter campaign, in what they say was a scheduling mistake, ran a toughly worded commercial on CBS, which accused Reagan of having a fractured view of America and speaking disdainfully about millions of citizens. Privately, some Carter aides were dismayed at the negative turn in the president's rhetoric on race. 
They're afraid Reagan and John Anderson will strike back in tomorrow night's debate and create an anti-Carter backlash. Bill Lynch, NBC News, with the Carter campaign at the White House. All quiet on the Reagan front today. The candidate no doubt saving his remarks for the podium in Baltimore at the debate tomorrow. Well, earlier in the week, as Heidi Schulman reports, it was a different story. Ronald Reagan is letting others respond for him to the latest assaults from the Carter camp. This was his third day in seclusion in Virginia preparing for tomorrow's debate. But earlier this week, his own attacks on President Carter became more pointed. After promising not to make Iran a partisan political issue, he told a unity rally on Capitol Hill. The continued suffering of our hostages in Iran for nearly a year bears stark testimony to the decline of American prestige. And in Texas, he was asked about the president's remarks on racism. It's harmful and it's shameful because uh, uh, whether we're on the opposite sides or not, we ought to be trying to pull the country together, not tear it apart. Reagan was in Texas for a fundraising dinner, which raked in $2.8 million for Republican get-out-the-vote drives and to try to lure Mexican-American voters away from the Democrats. He seemed to suggest that an open border with Mexico is the solution to illegal immigration. The answer to this and many other problems is document the undocumented workers and make them legal coming into our country with a visa to come here and be a part for whatever length of time they want to stay. Later, Reagan claimed applause drowned out the rest. In my own mind, what I am thinking is that when someone comes into this country on a visa, there is a time period set on that visa. And that then, that's determined uh, between the two governments there. Reagan's first news conference in almost three weeks was another sign aides believe the candidate is back on track after opening blunders and another chance to blast Jimmy Carter for not debating tomorrow. If he does not debate, he will be telling the American people that he will not, that he cannot, defend his record. Television viewers will hear that message again tomorrow in Reagan's first anti-Carter commercials. They show an empty podium and charge the president isn't discussing inflation, unemployment, and high interest rates. They claim the country can't afford four more years. Heidi Schulman, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Virginia. This week, independent John Anderson's presidential campaign could be described as in a lull. It leveled off somewhere between last week's euphoria at his being included in the presidential debate and the realization that his performance tomorrow night could make or break his whole campaign. Bob Jamison reports. Everywhere he went this week, like Boulder, Colorado, Anderson looked to see if the president's refusal to debate was taking hold as an issue. It did not seem to be. And Anderson began to find the same frustration Senator Edward Kennedy found during the primaries. Let me tell you, Teddy Kennedy, I know how it feels. It's awfully hard to get him into the ring. I guess as far as Jimmy Carter is concerned, I'm the stealth candidate. I'm the stealth candidate. I don't show up on the Carter political radar screen. <laughs> Johnny Be Good, the song played at almost every campus rally. Johnny Be Good, the fervent hope his handlers have for Anderson's performance tomorrow night. Anderson left the campaign trail at midweek and was surrounded by those aides to prepare for the debate. Led by campaign manager David Garth and new press secretary Tom Matthews, they are urging the sometimes isolated Anderson to rediscover the kind of performance he gave in Iowa back in January at the first Republican debate. It's not easy sitting here in the heart of Iowa in farm country to support an embargo on the shipment of grain. There, supporting the grain embargo, Anderson was a calm, persuasive voice of short-term sacrifice. But later, at debates like this one in Illinois, he came off hot, angry, like a partisan infighter. Well, I have, to, I have to interrupt you when you don't tell the truth. When he meets Reagan tomorrow night, Anderson's handlers hope the candidate will do what he told reporters he intends to do. Uh, I, I shall not come clanking onto the stage in armor on that evening. Uh, I, I would hope that I could come equipped with a certain amount of discretion, uh, humor, wisdom, uh, avoid... Uh, what some people say is a tendency on my part to preach and sermonize uh, and simply talk to the American people. If Anderson does that and scores points, as he will try to do, against President Carter and Ronald Reagan, aides believe he will leave Baltimore with new credibility and a serious chance to develop a broader following. But a poor performance tomorrow night will only bring renewed charges that Anderson is little more than a spoiler. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Washington. 
NBC News will broadcast the presidential debate from Baltimore live at 10 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, followed by a special report at 11.30. Good evening. Two out of three major candidates for president meet tonight in Baltimore in the first nationally televised debate. The third will watch it at home on TV. Ronald Reagan and John Anderson are in Baltimore now. Three days of cram courses, practice questions, briefing books behind them. President Carter spent the weekend politicking in Chicago and fishing in Pennsylvania. It is an important night for all three candidates, a crucial night for John Anderson. We have two reports, beginning with Chris Wallace with the Reagan campaign. John Anderson arrived in Baltimore from Washington this evening with the future hopes of his campaign riding on the outcome of tonight's debate. From the beginning of his independent race five months ago, appearing here tonight has been considered crucial to his chances. It was the one opportunity to give him public equality with the Republican and Democratic nominees. But Anderson and the aides he has been closeted with for the past three days preparing for the encounter with Reagan admit that just being here in Baltimore tonight is no longer enough. Anderson's appearance in this room tonight will be the acknowledgement that he has become an important force in the campaign. But whether he leaves here tonight after the debate as a force for spoiling the outcome on November 4th or with a real chance to broaden his support, which has been hovering below 20 percent, depends upon how well he does and how much attention the debate gets. Anderson's strategy is simple, to appear presidential, in knowledge which he has in the past and in tone which aides acknowledge he has not. Anderson tonight will be fighting a growing bitterness toward the president to try to appear calm and persuasive and talk directly to the American people. The president's refusal to appear here tonight has caused exactly the problems the White House wanted to create for Anderson. There is a growing feeling in the Anderson campaign that the president's absence has successfully blunted the importance of tonight's debate, and they find little evidence it is catching on as an important issue for Anderson. All of this comes at a critical time for the independent candidate. He badly needs a stunning performance here tonight on which to build in the coming weeks of the campaign. Anything less, his aides admit, may make the president's summer prophecy come true that the independent candidate who bloomed in the spring may fade now that the campaign has reached autumn. Bob Jamison, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Baltimore. There will only be two blue swivel chairs on the stage of the Baltimore Convention Center tonight, but both Reagan and Anderson can be expected to remind their TV audience that there was supposed to be a third. President Carter will be sitting in front of a television set instead. Bill Lynch has that report. The president flew back from Camp David this evening to watch his two principal opponents from the comfort of the executive mansion. But he did not want to talk about the Anderson-Reagan matchup and its impact on his campaign. Four years ago, as a newcomer to national politics, Jimmy Carter couldn't afford not to debate. On balance, political analysts believe his three encounters with Gerald Ford helped Mr. Carter to a narrow victory. Last May, he went before the League of Women Voters and promised to join their 1980 debates. We'd like to know if you'd give your promise to us today to participate in the league-sponsored presidential debates this fall if you are the nominee of the Democratic Party. Yes. Mr. Carter also committed himself to debating Anderson and other third-party candidates. Only later did he modify his stand to insist on a one-on-one -on -one with Reagan as the first debate. Reagan and the league didn't buy that, and the president made the tactical decision to duck the Baltimore debate. That drew predictable fire from Reagan and Anderson. The editorial cartoonists had a field day, especially when the league considered putting an empty chair on stage. After strong protest from Carter aides, the chair idea was dropped. The major concern here continues to be Anderson's potential to siphon Democratic votes. And to the extent he's helped by his primetime exposure tonight, that's very bad news for the Carter campaign. By continuing to ignore Anderson and faulting Reagan for avoiding a one-on-one -on -one debate, Mr. Carter hopes to neutralize the effect of his Baltimore boycott. Bill Lynch, NBC News, with the Carter campaign at the White House. And now, Chris Wallace with the Reagan campaign recently arrived in Baltimore for the debate tonight. Here's Chris Wallace. Reagan helicoptered to Baltimore late this afternoon after three intensive days preparing for the debate. Aides were confident Reagan can handle John Anderson and seem more interested in scoring points against the man who won't be there, Jimmy Carter. The Reagan camp thinks the president will be hurt by his absence and wasted no time making it an issue. Unveiling a new commercial during the football games today, the charges Mr. Carter turned down the debate because he can't defend his record on unemployment and inflation. Maybe he won't debate because he knows the real question is, 
Can we afford four more years of this? In addition to raising doubts about the president, no Reagan aides want to ease doubts about their man. They acknowledge that recent controversial statements have hurt the campaign. But Press Secretary Lynn Nossiger says tonight Reagan will show he is presidential. I think that uh, many Americans who might have had doubts because they don't know him or all they know is what they have read in the newspapers or they've seen a 30-second clip on television will get a chance to view him in depth, and I think that uh, uh, that's going to be a very big plus for Governor Reagan. But for all the talk about Carter and Reagan, tonight's debate is with Anderson, and that presents a problem. Reagan aides say their candidate must beat the Illinois congressman, but not so badly it destroys Anderson's ability to draw votes from the president. They also say that Anderson will set the tone for the debate. Reagan would be delighted if they both went after Mr. Carter. But if Anderson attacks Reagan, then Reagan is prepared to fight back. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Baltimore. President Carter was having some trouble with his rhetoric today as he campaigned in California. His aide said that something the president had said last night about Ronald Reagan was an overstatement. The president addressed a labor convention in Los Angeles last night and implied that the election of Reagan could lead the country into war. Here's how he put it. Six weeks from now, the American people will make a very profound choice. A choice not just between two men or two parties, but between two futures. And what you decide on that day, you and those who listen to your voice, will determine what kind of life you and your families will have, whether this nation will make progress or go backward, and whether we have peace or war. Reagan was campaigning in Florida and was quick to seize on the president's statement. Before the president's press secretary admitted that the president had overstated the case, Reagan was describing Mr. Carter's implication that a Reagan administration might lead the country into war as beneath decency. Chris Wallace was with the Reagan campaign today. This morning, Reagan was asked about Mr. Carter's statement as he left his Miami hotel. He appeared angry. It's inconceivable that anyone, and particularly a president of the United States, would imply that anyone, any person in this country, would want war. And that's what he's charging, and I think it's unforgivable. Reagan aides called it another low blow from the president. And by the time Reagan got to Pensacola, he was ready to capitalize on it. The Reagan camp thinks this attack, and last week's accusing Reagan of racism, hurt Mr. Carter's nice guy image. Reagan told a rally the president's remark was beneath decency. But in a big military town, he also talked about defense. World peace has got to be the principal aim of this nation and world peace can be obtained only by maintaining a strength that will keep any potential adversary from ever challenging this nation. Later, a big reception at Louisiana State University. And with many students present, Reagan talked about another defense issue. Mr. Carter has instituted registration for the draft and he believes that this is the best way freedom can be defended. I oppose registration for the draft. The Reagan camp ended the southern swing increasingly confident it can cut into the president's base here. And one of the main reasons is the very thing that Mr. Carter was attacking, Reagan's strong defense posture. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Independent candidate John Anderson was asked today to comment on the idea that he can only be a spoiler in this presidential election, and he answered, what's to spoil. Anderson said that if he weren't a candidate this year and the only choices were Reagan and Carter, he wouldn't cast a vote for either one. In 1972, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota was the Democratic presidential nominee. In 1980, he's running for re-election and he's got some problems. Carol Simpson reports. Senator George McGovern is in political trouble in South Dakota because he has two major opponents to worry about. One is Congressman James Abner, the Republican candidate. The other and more formidable opponent is the New Right Movement. For two years, right-wing groups have flooded the state with materials, calling McGovern everything from a baby killer to a traitor. Every one of those letters carries a message of hate, distortion, fear, that makes it very difficult for a public figure to sustain his uh, public reputation. But the hate campaign against McGovern began to backfire when many South Dakotans began resenting outsiders telling them how to vote. So the anti-McGovern drive has begun to subside.
Congressman Abner admits ultra-conservatives urged him to run against McGovern, but he said he doesn't condone their tactics. I never asked him to come in. I, I, I don't want I should have didn't go out and encourage him any more I did than, than these other groups. But McGovern has already been hurt, and he's mounting a strong come-from-behind campaign. In the upcoming election between uh, George McGovern and Jim Abner, who do you think you'll support? McGovern plans to spend one and a half million dollars on commercials and direct mail, all designed to set the McGovern record straight. I uh, intend to run uh, from here until November 4th as a liberal Democrat. That's what I am. If I tried to shift gears or change colors at this point, uh, I not only would lose, I'd deserve to lose. Congressman Abner is also conducting a million dollar campaign and his candidacy got a big boost last week when former President Ford came to the state on his behalf. McGovern has another opponent, Wayne Peterson, a farmer, but his independent bid for the Senate is given little chance of winning. Even though Senator McGovern still faces an uphill battle, more and more South Dakotans are saying the race will be tight and McGovern just might win. Carol Simpson, NBC News, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 400 phone interviews around the country made earlier this week. We asked the likely voters in this sample how the vote would go if the election were held today. The results show little change from our last poll, and they show no change at all for John Anderson. The polling was done after he debated Ronald Reagan. Two-thirds of our sample has already decided how it will vote, which we think is the meaningful way to look at this, and Reagan, as you see, leads in this group. As he leads among undecided voters, Reagan made his biggest gain since we last polled among people who have yet to decide. So Reagan is holding his lead, but there hasn't been much change in the last month or so. Anderson did not get a boost from his debate with Reagan. We did learn that our sample thinks that Carter would be better than Reagan at keeping the country out of war. But we also learned that the economy is regarded as a more important problem than war and that those we polled believe Reagan would do a better job on the economy than Carter. Reagan made one policy change for his campaign today, the change brought about by the conflict between Iraq and Iran. Chris Wallace, traveling with Reagan, has the story. Reagan has rejected administration briefings all year, saying they might prevent him from speaking out on foreign policy. Three days ago, he said it again. I think that I have some sound advisors and sources of information, and uh, uh, I'd just rather stay in the clear. But today, arriving in Los Angeles, Reagan announced he and running mate George Bush will be briefed on the Mideast crisis late next week. Reagan aides explained that the White House was saying Reagan's refusal was irresponsible. The candidate was concerned about that. I think with this conflict going on, there was only one way to uh, to have access to the information. I'm not wanting to inadvertently say anything that might be harmful. Uh, we decided that it's proper to get briefed on that. Since Reagan's last refusal, he has blamed the Mideast War on a weak Carter foreign policy. But he gave another reason for now changing his mind on briefings. Well, I was speaking of, of general briefings on an entire foreign situation, foreign policy. But this conflict, I think this is a different situation. Reagan is so concerned the briefings will be used to silence him that he's taken special safeguards. He's asked the CIA to conduct them, believing that that will make them less political. And he's asked George Bush to join in because he briefed Jimmy Carter in 1976 and knows how an administration can manipulate a candidate. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Los Angeles. But George Bush will not participate in the vice presidential debate sponsored by the League of Women Voters. Vice President Mondale and John Anderson's running mate, Patrick Lucy, had accepted, but it's not known now if they'll turn up for a two-man vice presidential debate. Television seems to be growing more and more important to politicians, and nowhere is this more apparent than it is on presidential campaigns. Tom Pettit has had a look. Gentlemen. Presidential campaign backgrounds are no accident for the candidates or the network reporters. Heidi Shulman, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Grand Junction, Colorado. John Palmer, NBC News, with President Carter in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Be it a cowboy hat in the Rockies, a hard hat, or a statue, there's little news in backgrounds. A White House, a black church, a town meeting or the champion boar of Iowa. What we try to do is, is find a, uh, a background that matches the topic that we're trying to push that day. Since uh, our business is trying to get our message on the air and to the American public, 
we are obviously going to do the things that we can to, uh, to uh, make sure you cover what we do. When a candidate shows up, the people who live there become part of the background for TV. The president supplies his own background. Anderson arrived in Cleveland today with no stunning backgrounds. After the plane, the bus, the cameras, the news conferences, even print journalists often utilize television to see what the rest of the country sees. After all the electronics, there remains news management by campaign managers, often aimed at the producers who put the reports on the air, coordinating the videotape editing with reporters' narration. Reagan staffers on one occasion sent a police car with siren blaring to get a network producer to the scene of an event. Manipulation or cooperation? El Paso, Texas, Wednesday. Network deadlines coming up. Look for manipulation. Reagan shielded from the press. The press trying to find out what he had said about Iraq and Iran in private interviews earlier. You can't run paper on TV. The CBS producer looking worried. Campaigns know they need him to get their message out. Reagan staffer Steve Stuttered. But Dean was there. He said he tried to yeah. get in, and I and, and, uh, wouldn't let him in. Who would? Whoever was, was setting up the interview. Secret or Service or somebody, right? Well, I don't know, but you ought to make a point of finding both I liars. Looked, I looked all over for him. Reagan worked a factory. Reporters quoted transcripts. Press Secretary Nofziger finally alerting the networks Reagan would speak. All right, now where did you guys want right here? Right where he said. Right where and he when do we want him? Now! Reagan read a 37-second statement took no questions about his Middle East comments. Everything was nicely controlled. Reagan made ABC and CBS. NBC quoted. ABC producer Steve Skinner. Reagan has made a statement that they said they would not. The campaigns all know how late you can do something and still make the evening news with something you want. Or miss the news, if that serves the candidate's purpose. Tom Pettit, NBC News, Cleveland. The League of Women Voters today appealed to the three major presidential candidates to settle their differences and get on so debates can be held. We have two reports about the campaign, beginning with Chris Wallace traveling with Governor Reagan. Reagan was the gentleman rancher today, on the way to his Santa Barbara home to repair some fences. He stopped just long enough to make some political repairs. Denying White House charges, he's ducking a debate. As long as the other guy is a viable candidate, Anderson, then I feel it. We should all be involved. In fact, while Reagan would agree to a round-robin format, aides acknowledge they don't want any more debates. Almost buoyant about the way the campaign is going. It was a good week for Reagan. Even the issues were falling his way. One of Reagan's weaknesses is public concern that his hardline views might cause a war. But when Jimmy Carter said the election is a choice between peace and war, Reagan could respond with righteous indignation. Accused that anyone would deliberately want a war is beneath decency. And Reagan turned the issue around the next day, charging that a weak Carter foreign policy had helped cause the Iraq-Iran war. Reagan spent the end of the week out west, making sure his base is solid. He spoke out for local control of local resources, and he played on regional pride the way Jimmy Carter would in Alabama. Nancy and I have been about as homesick as any two people can be for this west because we have been campaigning the East for a month now. Reagan aides say the Carter record is so bad, all their man must do to win is show he's up to being president. This week, the campaign ran smoothly, like last night, when the Reagan motorcade drove along a California freeway at rush hour all by itself. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. With just over five weeks to go, President Carter is still scrambling to overtake frontrunner Ronald Reagan. National polls taken after last Sunday's Reagan-Anderson debate don't offer much encouragement. Uh, Mr. Anderson gained almost nothing from that, uh, that debate. Mr. Reagan, if he gained anything, gained uh, very little, probably not enough to be st statistically uh, significant. The Anderson factor continues to plague the president. State polls out this week show the independent candidate hurting Mr. Carter badly in Wisconsin and Connecticut. Reagan enjoys sizable leads in Ohio, New Hampshire, Kansas, and New Mexico. But recent polls also show Mr. Carter overtaking Reagan in the big electoral vote states of Texas and New York. A major Carter theme this week was to picture Reagan as trigger happy. At a labor meeting in Los Angeles, the president went so far as to say the election is a choice between war and peace. The next day he backed off, but not much. The call for the use of military forces in a um, very dangerous situation has been a repeated habit of his 
as a governor and as a candidate for president, what he would do in the Oval Office, I hope will, uh, will never be observed by the American people. To back its case, the White House distributed 10 Reagan quotes advocating U.S. military involvement in various trouble spots over the past dozen years. Now that chances for a Carter-Reagan debate have all but evaporated, the president apparently intends to continue trying to raise fears about Reagan. There's little evidence, though, that tactic is working. Bill Lynch, NBC News, with the Carter campaign at the White House. And on the subject of the Anderson factor, Jim Cummins is traveling with Anderson, and he has this report from Boston. Or brief. Each panel John Anderson had expected the debate question. to boost his standing in the polls you and revive his campaign. In which to I think the debate was a turning point in the campaign. The question is, which way did it turn? This week he raced around the country in his newly chartered 727, still ignored by prominent local politicians at every stop, seeing crowds that were no bigger than the ones he saw before the debate, and surprising his staffers who had expected a better turnout. By midweek, Anderson was feeling left out. You know, I feel a little bit like the, uh, like, uh, the little kid on the block uh, who, who's being ignored while, uh, while the two bullies go at each other. But the little kid threw a few punches of his own. He was repeatedly on the attack. To reject both the Republican and the Democratic Party. To reject both Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Anderson tried to take the offensive, but he was kept on the defensive by questions about his money problems, a report that his top advisors had given up any hope of winning, and the most nagging question, is he nothing more than a spoiler in this race? What's to spoil? What's to spoil when you consider what has happened in this country in four years? By week's end, Anderson had learned the debate barely improved his standing in the polls. Nothing had changed. Uh, I, I'm convinced that there will come a turning point in this campaign. Obviously, we haven't reached it yet. Today, Anderson is in Massachusetts, one of the few states where he's running close to his opponents. Anderson's top aides are now saying he's in the race to stay, even if it looks like he will take votes away from Carter and help Reagan become the next president. Jim Cummins, NBC News, with the Anderson campaign in Boston. Korsky, the Texas Democrat who gained a national reputation as a Watergate prosecutor, said today he will head a Democrats for Reagan organization. Jaworski told reporters in Washington that he is supporting Reagan because he'd rather have what he called a competent extremist in the White House than an incompetent moderate. During the Texas primary this year, Jaworski said a Reagan presidency could endanger the country. Mr. Carter was in New York City today chanting, I love New York and promising that he will always love New York, for a very good reason. John Palmer reports. Mr. Carter conceded today that he can't win re-election without New York State's 41 electoral votes. It's almost theoretically impossible, practically I'm sure it's impossible, to figure out how I can win re-election without New York State. Mr. Carter told a group of business and labor supporters that putting Ronald Reagan in the White House could lead to a doomed nuclear arms race and ill-considered military intervention around the world. Earlier, Mr. Carter toured the city's garment district and addressed the International Ladies Garment Workers Convention, charging that Reagan and the Republicans had turned their backs on American women by opposing the Equal Rights Amendment. He told the heavily Jewish audience that he will oppose strongly any effort to exclude Israel from the United Nations General Assembly. The illegal expulsion of a member of the family of nations from the General Assembly would be a challenge to the basic principles of the United Nations. It would raise the gravest questions about the future of the General Assembly and further participation of the United States and other nations in the deliberations of that body. We will not permit it. Carter campaign aides say the president plans at least four more visits to New York before Election Day. John Palmer, NBC News, with the Carter campaign in New York City. Ronald Reagan was on the road today in farm country making a major address on what he would do as president for the farmers of America. His main goal, he said, was to make farming a profitable enterprise. Chris Wallace was with the Reagan campaign in Iowa. Reagan was down on the farm this morning flipping flapjacks, trying to show he cares more about agriculture than any peanut farmer. Conservative, too conservative to waste anything. <laughs> Midwest farmers usually vote Republican, and a newspaper poll shows Reagan well ahead in Iowa. But today he was making sure of his support. 
Reagan said the president's agriculture policy is a disgrace, blaming it for a 20% drop in farm income this year. He praised the Senate for voting to kill the Soviet grain embargo. When the president just employed the grain embargo and everybody else kept sending things there, including an assembly line to build 12-cylinder diesel engines for tanks, Soviet tanks, it was grandstanding for the American people at your expense. While Reagan accused Mr. Carter of empty rhetoric, he had few specifics himself. He promised to phase out the estate tax, which he said drives families from their farms, expand agricultural exports, and appoint farmers to top government jobs. What farmers need in Washington is not just voices. They need more ears at the highest level of government. You know something? An elephant's ear is bigger than a jackass's ear. And if that weren't rural enough, Reagan closed the show posing on top of a tractor. Reagan is so confident of the farm boat, aides don't know whether there will be any more of these visits. After a half day in Iowa, he was off again to the industrial north. Reagan hoping to break the democratic hold in those big states. A job that makes flipping flapjacks look easy. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Reagan campaign in Des Moines. John Anderson, the independent candidate, was deep in tobacco country today at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He chose that particular location to make a call for an end to government price supports for tobacco. Vice President Mondale had some words about Anderson today. He told Bob Kerr of our staff that it's now time for Anderson to begin thinking of pulling out of the race. Uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson said repeatedly, not once, but several times, that if the only function of his campaign was to help Reagan, uh, that would be such an intolerable result that he'd get out. I think he's at the point in his campaign where he's got to uh, review and ponder uh, whether that time has come. Anderson's response, I am not about to take the advice of the vice president to get out of the race. After making his pilgrimage to the fields of Iowa, Ronald Reagan hit the streets of New York City, the biggest town in a state he hopes he can win this fall. President Carter was in New York yesterday, hoping he can win the Empire State, and Tom Pettit is in New York tonight with a report on these hopes. Carter must win New York's 41 electoral votes. The Reagan campaign is as quiet as the sound of money. About $2 million was coughed up for dinner with a candidate tonight at the Waldorf. The cast of the Democratic presidential race in New York is as big as Ben-Hur, filled with rivalries. Chaikin Labor, Gutbaum Labor, politician Patterson Black, Koch Mayor, Carey Governor, Holtzman Senate candidate, Javits Senate candidate. Javits, a loser on the Republican line, now is on the Liberal Party line, and with Anderson on the Liberal ticket too, the Carter forces are worried, worried their man will be losing votes to Anderson Javits. They want Javits to drop out and they want Anderson neutralized. In the large New York Jewish community, both Anderson and Reagan have some strength. Reagan is seen as good for the economy and strong on Israel by some Jews. Carter is in trouble on both counts, especially since the U.S. cast a vote against Israel at the U.N. last spring, a vote which was disavowed, but which cost Carter the New York primary. Eugene Gold, District Attorney, Brooklyn, Democrat and Jewish. I would be surprised if President Carter received more than 60% of the Jewish vote of this state. As a matter of fact, I think it's possible he'd receive even less. Which would cost Carter New York, even though he says... We will continue firmly to oppose any attempt to deprive the state of Israel of its legitimate rights as a respected member of the international community. The cornerstone of our effort and of our interest is a secure Israel. Hello, New York. Carter is the champion of aid to New York City, a big issue here. Reagan has ridiculed federal aid, but just Saturday, he announced he had seen the light and changed his mind in time for his arrival in New York this evening. Politicians agree New York is too close to call, but because of its overriding importance to Carter, millions will be spent on media from Buffalo to Brooklyn and a big budget for bagels. Tom Pettit, NBC News, New York.